Well, hello, and welcome to Crucial Conversations. I'm Peter. And I'm Kevin. And Kevin, we're not in the same room We're as not each other. even in the same city. There's a river between us. <laughs> an entire river that must be crossed. And many highways. Yes, on, on highways. So we're continuing to test technology, and this time we're testing recording in different locations because if this works out... We could have guests on our podcast. Well, then we got to find somebody who wants to be on our podcast. Well, I mean, I mean, Will, I think he wants to be on the podcast occasionally. I think, I think he's just too nice to say no, actually. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's probably equally likely. But hey, we are continuing our study on the two natures in Christ, our series on Christology. And today we're going to talk about the Gainus Apotelismaticum. And if you haven't stopped listening at that point, um, you're going to really enjoy this episode, I think, because we're talking about our Savior and getting to know him better and who he is. And that's a wonderful thing, right, Kevin? That is fantastic. (laughs) It's the best thing, really. It is, which is why we're happy to spend an entire year on Christology to talk through all of this stuff. If it ends up being a year or more or more, I don't know, whatever. Yeah. So, hey, this is our last podcast of the year. Hey, year again, uh, because it's the end of December and we're going to be on Christmas break for the next couple of weeks. So if you appreciate what we do here on the podcast with Crucial Productions in general, we would very much appreciate an end of year gift, uh, which is tax deductible to the fullest extent allowed by law. I think I said that sentence correctly. There's actually wrong ways to say that sentence. I think I said the right way. Um, If you're giving to us for a tax break, either your gift is way too big or you don't understand the tax laws. (laughs) I know that. Well, that's, that's the great part. Um, Anyways, anything is, is very much appreciated. Um, It helps us keep doing what we're doing and really be able to do more, more quickly. I, I think at this point we can continue just going the way we're going and it's fine, but if we want to put out more stuff at a faster pace, um, funding helps with that. Is that accurate, Kevin? I think that's correct. Yeah, because we can just keep doing this, and that's great. But anyways, what is this that we're doing, Kevin? I don't know. We are podcasting. <laughs> Actually, right now we're talking about the person and work of Jesus. So we're yeah. in Christology right now, which is... Um, other than talking about how to read the gospel of John, it's my favorite topic. Although I believe that Christology is how to read the gospel of John. So it's all kind of the same thing. I'm pretty sure John agrees with you on that. So you're in good company. I hope so. <laughs> so give us a quick de- definition of the Gainus Apotelis Medicum, since that's what we're talking about. Oh, before we do that, though, we had a question come in based on our last episode about the Latin words. And I, th- I think I asked this question. I don't remember if we spent any time on it, but um, a gentleman asked us, are there like English terms for this that might be easier to remember than the Latin ones? Or is Latin pretty much all we got for this? Well, Latin is the way the church has talked about it. So if you want to talk about it in a way that everyone will understand you, it helps to know the Latin words. But, you know, I, I, Gainus is really a kind, a thing, a kind of thing, right? <laughs> the type of thing something is. Uh, we think of the word like genre, a genre of literature. It's the same root. Um, so it's how you classify something or it's it's a way to talk about something. So the Gainus, all the three genera is really, it's a way to talk about um, how the nature's interact with each other and with the person of Christ. So the three genera are the ways that we talk about the communication of the natures with each other and with the person and work of Christ. So it was Thomas and he asked, are there English terms corresponding with these Latin terms? It might help understanding when to use which term. So basically the answer is not really. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, yes and no. So gayness is kind, right? Okay. That's what it kind of means, kind. 
anything. <laughs> Not kind as in being nice, kind as in, you know, that kind of thing. According to its kind. Yeah, according to its kind. Yeah. Those kinds of things. Um, and then, like we said, the the Latin words um, as we go, myestaticum is majestic, idiomaticum is attribute, and apotalismaticum is work. Apostella, apotelisma is a work. So this is the this is the um, the discussion of the work of Christ as pertains to his person and two natures is what we're discussing today in the Gainus Apotelismaticum. So the work of Christ as it pertains to his two natures. And his person. And his person. Because so, everything we talk about with Jesus, we have one person with two natures. So what we've got going on here then is that, okay, there are English terms, but they're phrases if you're really going to use English, whereas Latin actually gives us a shorter terminology in this case, right? Well, I mean, you could just say this is the discussion of Jesus's works. Okay. As they, as they belong to, as his two natures are involved with his person. I mean, that's the problem is whenever you're going to start using something other than the, the terminology that's been accepted, you have to explain what you're meaning. Yeah. That's and I, I think, I think that's what word. I've been feeling last time. And I think Thomas, why well, I asked Thomas's question here is because it's even as we're trying to go through this, we're demonstrating the difficulty of, well, yes, but does it actually help? Yeah. I mean, it's again, the, what you want to do is you want to use the words that the church uses. And it's not because you're trying to show off your knowledge. It's just that these are the words that the church uses. And so you're going to be speaking the correct language when you talk about things in the way that the church has just historically talked about it. And when I mean church, I mean Orthodox Christendom going back to the days of the creeds. Okay. So we're looking back into 300s and 400s. So that's the, the 4th and 5th century AD when the church started talking about the gain as apotelismaticum. And the church was using Latin primarily at that point. Still a lot of Greek, but moving towards Latin, right? Right. So all of these, these have Greek roots. So no offense to your Latin scholars out there, but Latin is really just fancy Greek <laughs> yeah. written in English, you know, an American typeset. So that's not really true. That's, that's, how like, that's how I like to think about it because I like Greek better. But, um, apotelismatic, apotelisma is a Greek word. Oh. It is a Greek word for work. Okay. I, I keep reacting as if this is like the first time I've heard it because I keep forgetting that you've said this a couple times. So it is like it's a the first times. time I've heard it e each that's time. Right. I, yeah. But hey, I, I now can remember apotelismaticum. So right. I mean, it just means work. It's just a really long word for work. For work. Okay. Like something someone does to work. All right. Why does this matter? Why are we talking about this today, Kevin? Well, because uh, the gain of Apotelis Monicum is, is kind of the coolest of the three in that this is the place where we confess that all of this talk about Christ in his person and two natures is really in order to focus on the fact that everything Jesus did as one person with two natures, he did in order to accomplish our salvation. And that's the point of the Gainus Apotelismaticum is that both natures are at work in the person of Christ as he works to accomplish our salvation. Hmm. Okay. So you might see him according to one nature or the other, like we talked about with, with idiomaticum, that when he's hungry, you say, well, he's hungry according to his human nature. But as he is working that work, he is doing it with both natures in order to accomplish our salvation. So as Jesus dies on the cross, you say he suffers according to his human nature, but both natures are at work in that act of dying so the point is that all of this is done in order to accomplish our salvation 
So we say that the person of Christ, the Logos, right, yeah. is at work, both natures contributing to the work, and that work is done for the goal of our salvation. Where, where do we get the part where it's for the goal of our salvation? Where do we look in Scripture to see that? Well, the uh, that's not as obvious from the name from the upward. This is this is kind of one of the the easy ones that we overlook. Oh. But John three sixteen is the easiest verse to think about when you think, well, why did Jesus come? And it's really simple. God loved the world, so He sends His Son. Right. Mm -hmm. That whoever believes in Him might not perish, but have everlasting life, eternal life. And the Son of Man did not come to condemn the world but to save the world. Yeah. So we don't want to make it any more complicated than that. So you think of that verse, that's John 3, 16 and 17. You also think of Galatians 4, 4, which is, it's Christmassy right now around here. <laughs> so that's our Christmas passage where it says that when the time had fully come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under law, in order to redeem those under the law. Right. So that the in order to the reason he came, the reason the father sent the son, the reason the son willingly came in flesh is in order to save, in order to redeem, in order to die and rise to accomplish the salvation of sinners in order to give life. Right. We think John 20 verses 30 and 31, you know, Jesus did many other signs. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing, have life in his name. And in the so article that the we're goal. working from um, with um, uh, Maxwell, he references John 6.51, where it says he give his flesh for the life of the world, which jumps out to me because Whedon is actually covering that very passage today on his podcast. So that was like, oh, hey, cool. Fine. It's all coming together. Everything's coming together in John. That should make because we have the same book. As I say, that should make you happy, Kevin. It's all coming together in John, as it should. So we're we're this this gayness answers the question: Why did why is Jesus doing what he's doing? Why did Jesus come? And it focuses our thought on: Okay, it's towards all of this to the savior of the world is that one way of putting it is that accurate and then how do his well, two natures work together towards that end maybe that's the part i was missing it doesn't the gainus apostolic malcolm doesn't necessarily answer the question of why he came it confesses that all that he did he did toward the end of saving us okay toward the goal of saving us so what we what we confess in the genus apotelismaticum is that we have one person and everything that one person does both natures contribute to that work and all of that is done with the goal of saving sinners the reason this is important is because there's heresies that said that Christ would act according to one nature, but not the other at certain times. So they would uh -huh. say, well, the divine nature isn't active in this, or the human nature isn't active in that. And that sounds kind of okay, but when you think about it, then you have a human Jesus doing certain things and a divine Jesus doing certain other things, and that just doesn't work. Now we're separating the two natures. Like you said at the beginning, we kind of have our metric of here's, here's how we make sure we're not stringing to heresy. This heresy of separating them out from each other in such a way that they're too distinct. I don't know. It, it's like the Nestorian heresy right, where you got so the two boards glued together and you can just kind of take them apart or identify them separately. And... This even gets so far as to having real problems with not just how we talk about Jesus, but even believing the scriptures as they portray the Christ to us as he truly is. And, and then you have to start implying things from scripture that we don't want to imply. And this has larger implications when 
um, certain people would deny the gain is apotelis modicum or try to change the words of it to suggest that the finite cannot contain the infinite. And so when the human Jesus is doing something that is certainly divine, they would say, well, the human nature is not part of that action because he can't be part of something that would be, you know, a divine attribute. And we would confess that the person of Christ is, is active with both natures in all of his works. So when it says that Jesus, you know, does something that you would, you, you would say, well, that's a divine characteristic. Then some would say, well, you can't assign that to human nature because a human nature can't have divine characteristics. If it had divine characteristics, it don't want to be a human nature anymore. And we say, we're not assigning, we're not saying the human nature stops being human. What we're saying is each nature contributes its unique characteristics to the person of Christ for the goal of accomplishing our salvation. So we don't mix the natures. We don't confuse the natures. Mm -hmm. But we also don't tear them apart and have two different Jesuses, each one with a unique nature. We're, we're kind of getting into what happened to us last week, talking about the Gainus Idiomaticum, where last week the Apotelus Modicum started bleeding into th that discussion. And now we're seeing it happen the other way because we still want to say, you know, he's acting according to his human nature. We're, we're seeing this according to his human nature, but with the Gainus Apotelus Maticum, we're also saying, but that doesn't mean his divine nature is not also present and working in that. He's simply acting according to his human nature when he does this. Is that the right way of conceiving this? Yeah, that's, that's kind of one way to think it through. Um, Last week, I was all over the heresy because as I'm trying to think through, so I, I think I'm doing a little better this time. <laughs> well, you, you know, you're not going to get better at this. Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's simply, again, the goal of Christology is not even, and I, this is going to sound so strange, but it's not to avoid heresy. It really is to confess what the scriptures confess. Okay. And the reason we care about heresy is because heresy is confessing something that scripture doesn't confess. That makes sense. Yeah. And because faith in Christ is an eternal matter, right? Faith in Christ is eternal life. That means that we want to be careful about how we talk about Jesus so that we're not saying things that scripture doesn't teach us to say. And this is, this gets to be the issue with this gayness is that, we just want to kind of let scripture say what it says. And I continue to encourage everybody who's listening to anything on Christology to simply remember one passage, first John one seven. And it's not even the whole verse. It's actually just part of it. It's actually the very end of the verse and the, the blood of Jesus, his son cleanses us from all sin. And in that short phrase, you have so much Christology. It really does help with both Gainus Apotelis Modicum and Gainus Idiomaticum is that the blood of Jesus. Now that's, that's totally a human thing. Yeah. Right? That's definitely that's human a, nature. God doesn't have blood it, in and of his being outside of the incarnation. Jesus, God doesn't have blood, right? So this is something we would say is a very human description of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. And then his son, now we're moving into more divine things and then it purifies us from all sins. Well, this is definitely moving totally into the divine realm where even Jesus himself says, you know, that only God can forgive sins. So somehow this blood of Jesus, who is God's son, purifies us from all of our sins. Now we have this, this one person of Jesus who has the qualities of both human and divine. And we would say, according to idiomaticum, we would say, well, he sheds his blood according to his human nature and he forgives the sins of the whole world according to his divine nature. He is Jesus, the son of Mary, according to his human nature. He is the son, the eternal son of the father, according to his divine nature. 
right? Yeah, and he's... That's what we did last week. Yeah, and his work that we're talking about now, the Genus Apostolus Maticum, those two natures are working to cleanse us from all sin. So so what did Genus Apostolus Maticum as the conversation is, you've said he does this according to that nature and he does that according to that nature, but what we say in the Genus Apostolus Maticum is that both natures are present and active to accomplish the work of salvation. Yeah. And in this verse, cleanses us from all sin is that work of salvation. That's how it's talking about it, right? Yeah. And and the blood of Jesus, the fact that he shed his oh, blood. Sure. So, the, so the dying on the cross would also yep. be part of that work. Okay. So this is where you get to your question last week about some people say that Jesus did miracles simply by the power of the Holy Spirit and not of his own volition or accord, right? Yeah. So that Jesus, Jesus is going around doing miracles kind of with the same power the apostles would have later. Yeah, not using his own makes, divine nature, but just using the power from the Holy Spirit. And this makes sense. If you look at the book of Acts, especially the transition between the earthly ministry of Jesus as Peter describes it in his sermon in Acts 2, and then you read on to Acts 3 and 4 about the ministry of the apostles, especially Peter, the exact same words are used to describe Peter's ministry as are used to describe Jesus' ministry. Hmm. So it makes sense that we would say, oh, it's the same mission, it's the same ministry, it's the same power at work. Right. And so we're not assigning to Peter a divine nature by any means. So how is Peter doing signs and wonders? How is he you know, healing people? How does Paul raise the dead with Eutychus? How are the apostles doing these things? And the answer is clear, it's the Holy Spirit. So then logically we say, well, then that's the same thing that Jesus is doing. And that, and that gets us into the problem that we're always struggling against is then we're using logic and reason to read back into scripture what we think it's saying rather than simply confessing what scripture says or in this case you've simply forgotten that jesus isn't like every other guy on the face of the <laughs> yeah. earth. i mean yeah that's really nice and there are parallels and there's a reason for that and jesus talks about that especially in the gospel of john uh but when we talk about jesus you, you can't forget who you're talking about. This is not just another guy that shows up on the scene. As a matter of fact, that's what the Jews accuse him of. In John chapter 8, they're like, well, how can you say these things? You know, how can you claim such grandiose things about yourself? You don't even have a legitimate father. Mm, yeah. You know, and and, and he's, he's making these, these huge claims and they say, well, you're saying all this stuff, but our father Abraham, are you greater than Abraham? And that's where Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. So in essence, he's saying, yes, I am greater than Abraham. As a matter of fact, if you listen to how I'm speaking, I'm speaking like God speaks. And this is another one of those where they're like, okay, then we're going to pick up stones and kill you. Right. And he says, not yet. Right. That's going to come later. Yep. But, but the point of all this is when you look at this and you say, well, therefore Jesus is going around and doing the same thing the apostles were doing, you say, that's correct. And you say, well, it's, it, therefore it's by the same power and the apostles are doing it by the Holy Spirit, therefore Jesus was doing the Holy Spirit. And you say, okay, Holy Spirit is present at Jesus' baptism, shows up, stays on him, that's fine. But Jesus is not a normal human being like the apostles are. He is the eternal son of God. And in Jesus is a human nature, just like in Peter, but without sin. But in Jesus is also a divine nature. So when Jesus is at work, he is doing things according to his human nature. But his divine nature is also present and active in all the things that he does to accomplish our salvation. So he is not doing miracles simply by the power of the Holy Spirit, because mm -hmm. that would be a denial of what we call the personal union of Christ. What we confess is that in all the things he does, even if the Holy Spirit is present working with him, because of course Trinity is, is united, 
yet it is the divine nature in Christ is active in everything he does along with his human nature to affect the things that result in our salvation. And it it's simply the way to confess what scripture presents to us as the person and work of Christ. So I had a situation over the weekend. I'm, I'm trying to think if this, how, if, if what we're studying now is actually helpful in that situation. So I, I, I'll lay, I'll lay it out for you here. We had a parents day out sponsored by our life team at our church. And so those of us on the life team were the volunteers to help organize this. And I volunteered to read children's stories. And I was going through different books that we had and picking out ones, you know, just your fun, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, which was really fun to read when you have a cold and your voice is going. You can do a really Mm. nice Grinch voice (laughs) when that's the case. And then, of course, I went, well, it's a church event and this Christmas is actually about Jesus. So let's read some children's first Christmas nativity kinds of books as well. Um, What I found interesting is it was actually easier to read through the ones where it's like from the animal's perspective and what's going on, because that's kind of all made up. What was harder was finding books that were actually attempting to do a somewhat faithful account of the nativity, mainly because whenever they got to the angel appearing to Mary, Gabriel appearing to Mary and announcing, here's what's going to happen. Half of the books would just kind of skip over the the virgin part and just move on without even mentioning that. And so the story seems kind of like, okay, it's just a girl who's going to have a baby. What's the big deal about that? Or a young woman who's going to have a baby. What's the big deal? Um, one of them actually handled it differently where it said, where Mary says, I don't have a husband. How can this be? And I, and like I, like you and I were talking about this this afternoon, I understand attempting to avoid having the mommy, what's a virgin conversation with a four year old. Right. Yes. <laughs> it's like, okay, yeah, that, that can be uncomfortable. But, and I think there are ways to do that well, but in, in, in the context of this conversation and the two natures in Christ and going through that, this really bumped me because I'm like, well, what are we now confessing as, as we read this? And you can have the discussion as to, am I thinking too deeply about a children's book? That might be a valid point too, because it's just a kid's book. But when we're talking about wanting to confess what scripture says, and here's a children's book that in most cases seems to be trying to do that and it's skipping something. And what it's skipping is kind of the divine nature of Jesus. When we're talking about the two natures in Christ, I, it's just, I didn't know what to do with that. So those books, I just kind of like, I'm I'm not going to read those. That's just, we're going to set those aside. I'm not sure what to do with those. Does this help us work through that real life situation? Does it help me at all as I'm considering, okay, what am I going to teach my four-year-old? How am I going to actually talk through this with my kids? I personally am not necessarily trying to avoid the virgin conversation. Um, Obviously, not going to have a graphic conversation, but that, or does this, is this something else entirely? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm reticent to say that it's the exact parallel because then you're getting into things that scripture doesn't necessarily say. Um, What we want to confess when we talk about the incarnation of Jesus is that he was born of the Virgin Mary and conceived of the Holy Spirit and just kind of leave it at that. Um, There's a lot of stuff when talking to children about the scriptures that are, it is very uncomfortable and you know, it, it's not uncommon if you've ever taught confirmation or, or something for junior high kids and all of a sudden you're reading and it says, therefore circumcision means nothing or un, you know, or uncircumcision means nothing. And some kid will say, well, what's circumcision, <laughs> you know? And then you have this uncomfortable pause of, well, 
ask your parents, especially if they're junior but, hires and you know, that's just going to yeah. trigger them. <laughs> yeah. That's you're, you're off and running at that point. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> so, um, the, the problem with the Bible is that it, it's kind of just too real. It's not a fairy tale that exists up in some sphere of spirituality. This is real stuff. And, and when you talk about the Christmas story, one thing you do want to teach is that Mary was a real person and Jesus was a real baby in her womb. And that happened by the power of the Holy Spirit in a virgin, which means she wasn't physically able to conceive with Joseph, that that hadn't happened. So we want to help children wrestle with what does it mean that she's a virgin and in I think you and I talked about this earlier. One really good and easy way to get to talk about this is to simply say she wasn't married. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The one that did it well said her response was, well, I don't have a husband. Right. I was like, oh, and, okay. and that's yeah. it. I think that's a very beneficial way to, to handle this and something that I would encourage Christians to think about. I've said this many times and gotten in trouble for it, but there is no way to have a child outside of being married. Mm, you're going to have to unpack that because our culture would definitely say otherwise. I don't believe our culture knows the truth. Yes. <laughs> God did not design a way to have a baby outside of marriage. He designed marriage to be the only context in which you have a baby because the only context in which you do what needs to be done in order to be pregnant is after you are married. Mm, yeah. And the church should not be ashamed to confess that, that the only acceptable way to do this. And so we could just simply say the way that you have a child is after you get married, mm -hmm. you do not have a child outside of marriage. And so that's actually what's happening with Mary is that she's having a child when she's not married. God, God's normally going against say, his own creation, it would seem. Well, it seems like he's breaking the mold anyway, or breaking the pattern, which is exactly what Matthew 1 talks about, is all this begetting, which happens naturally with a man and a woman, and then all of a sudden, the most important begotten is not from Joseph and Mary, but of the Virgin Mary, by conceived by the Holy Spirit. And this is kind of the point is he is a human. He has a human nature, but he's divine. He has a divine nature. And this Jesus, who is the Christ, is unique. There is no one like him. Now, by grace, he shares in our humanity, but also by grace, he lifts up our humanity into his divinity. And no one else can make that claim, which is why when we confess the Gainus Apotelis Modicum, we don't want to lose those truths. Mm -hmm. We don't want to say, well, no, he's really just a guy or no, he's not really a person. No, we want to, we want to leave both intact. And we say the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sins. We confess his full human nature and his full divine nature and say that they are both at work contributing the unique attributes to the person. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to smush them together and confuse them, but they each are at work in the one person of Jesus to accomplish salvation. So everything you see Jesus doing, both mm -hmm. natures at work because both natures are always present and active in the person of Christ. Now, what's interesting because of our conversations we've been having here on the podcast, uh, my, my initial impulse in reading these was to say, well, you can't leave out the virgin birth because Christ has to be divine and the virgin birth is required to make him divine. And so you, you can't leave that out of the story. But as we've talked about, that's me telling God what he has to do. Instead, I, I started thinking, okay, that's not what scripture says happened. And so my struggle with this shouldn't be, it can't happen that way. It should be, is that how scripture talks about this? And is there a faithful way 
to tell this story to a child that confesses what Scripture confesses. And, and I think that's exactly right. How do we tell a child the story being faithful to Scripture? And I think the most faithful, faithful way to tell the story of Christmas is, is simply the way John does it, is that this eternal Word of God becomes flesh and dwells among us. And how does that happen? Now you're going to read Luke 2 and Matthew 1, where they're going to talk about how this came to being. You know, how did this happen? So theologically, we're talking about the Son of God in flesh, the Word made flesh. And then they say, well, well, how did that happen? Well, you know the story, right? Mm -hmm. When, When Caesar Augustus told the whole world to be taxed and they had to go to their own hometown. And so Joseph and Mary go to Bethlehem and she was pregnant, but they weren't married yet. So it wasn't Joseph's kid. Well, whose was it? It was by the, by the Holy spirit and Mary was a virgin. And again, just in case any of our listeners haven't caught on yet, we are confessing the virgin birth. Yes. (laughs) That Mary was a virgin that that is the and problem I had with the meetings. stories that weren't confessing that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And and we do want to confess that um, because that is the truth of what happened. Yeah. It's, it's what scripture tells us happened. It's like, there it yes. is. There. And not just in one place. Yeah. It's what scripture presents throughout scripture as the way that this, this happened. Even in the old so, Testament actually is where we first hear exactly. of this. Yeah. So we, we don't want to shy away from that either. Right. Um, yeah. And that's, and that is part of the, the wonder of the Christmas story. You know, John the Baptist was also miraculously conceived, but not in the same miraculous way. Elizabeth was not a virgin. She was very old and beyond the, the childbearing years. And so everybody thought it was miraculous and it was mm-hmm. because God allowed it to happen, but it was still the natural way. And Elizabeth was not a virgin and it was Zechariah's son. Well, didn't, didn't but, we have this conversation, you and I, I don't think we've talked about it on the podcast, but how that's what the Israelites thought was going to be the case. Cause you have so many biblical examples You have Hannah, unable to conceive, and eventually has Samuel. Is that, did I get those two right? That's right. Yeah, Hannah and Samuel. You have Sarah, of course, with Isaac. Then you have Elizabeth with John. You have many examples of women who were barren, unable to conceive, and then all of a sudden God steps in and, okay, now you are going to conceive. It's miraculous in the sense that they weren't able to before, and then they do, but like you said, that they still are married, they still have a husband, and the conception is happening in the same natural way. And so, one of the thoughts at the time of Christ was, well, that's just kind of what's going to happen with the Messiah, too. When Scripture talks about a virgin, they don't mean an actual virgin. It means kind of like Sarah or like Hannah, that's going to be the situation. Right. Exactly. And then it was an actual virgin. <laughs> yeah. And then that is a, more than a little surprising. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wait, wait. So there's no man involved whatsoever in yeah. the entire process. We didn't see right. that coming. We <laughs> did not see that one coming. <laughs> so we need to wrap it up here because our time is running yes. out. But, but again, as we even talk about the Christmas story, what we confess is that this, and, and a lot of people say it this way, the God man, Jesus Christ. So that's, that's confessing both natures in one person, the God man, Jesus Christ, everything he did, he did for the goal of saving sinners like you and me and everything he did, both natures, both his human and his divine nature were active in that. So that you can't ever say one nature was not working or was apart from him, but he simply did everything by both natures. They were both there. Yeah. They're both active and working to accomplish salvation. Yeah. And that's, that's the crucial conversation. I mean, that's, that's what all this is about. When we come back from our break, 
we will be now, Kevin, we talked about doing a special episode where we answer listener questions because we've actually gotten quite a few questions, uh, some really good questions that we want to dig into. So we might do a special episode where we just answer your questions, but there's another gainus still. There is a whole other gainus to go, and it's the most complicated one. <laughs> and By far. also controversial, right? I mean, these two are pretty much everybody's like, yeah, we're all on the same page. But the next one... There's there's some discussion to be had, right? Yes, a lot. All right. So our listeners, you'll want to join us uh, in the new year when the time comes for that. We look forward to digging into that and helping you guys out. Thanks for your questions. If you do have questions, send them to questions at crucialproductions.org or head on over to our website, crucialproductions.org, and click the Ask a Question button there at the top of the page. Um, yeah. Any final questions? other things kevin am i forgetting something i feel like i'm forgetting something go to church yeah it's christmas go to church it's christmas that's the best time go to advent service if you can if they're still going on probably not by the time the kids release but go to christmas services go on christmas day it is actually the day so go yep <laughs> a lot of people go skip christmas for some reason but but i have i encourage everybody who's listening to to find a lutheran church an lcms congregation and look up their schedule for Christmas Eve and Christmas Day and just go. And there are going to be some fantastic services. If, if you haven't been a part of a liturgical tradition, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day are excellent days to get introduced to that. It's, it's quite wonderful. Yes, it yeah. is. All right. Well, that's all we have for you. We'll see you guys in the new year. See ya.